Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag, but I can't do the normal intro because this is not a normal mailbag. This is the first ever coaches mailbag where I bring on a great tennis mind to join me to answer your questions about the game of tennis. It's not necessarily about the tours. In fact, I encouraged uh, those of you in the YouTube community tab to ask questions that weren't specific to the pro game or the tour uh, as we stand right now, uh, but ask ask your questions about technique, about tactics, about the mental game, all of that. And uh, you guys certainly did a great job of giving me tons to work with. I have never really done content like this where I position myself as someone who is going to give sort of instructional advice. There's a reason for that. It's because I think there are a bunch of people out there who are smarter than me, who are better than me at this, who have more training in this, you know, in these areas where I think I mean, I break down matches, and I think I do that really well, I like to think. But when it comes to instructional content, I've always felt it's better to leave that to other people. That is why I'm bringing on a guest here and somebody who does the instructional content, in my opinion, as well, if not better, than anybody else. And that's Jonathan Stokey, host of the Baseline Intelligence podcast. He also just started a YouTube channel. He's going to have some instructional stuff on there. He is a private coach in Charleston. I will link that YouTube channel somewhere here. I don't know exactly how, but I will link it uh, so that you guys will have access to it. Uh, but this was a, a really, really good chat. I'm so happy with how the first ever Coach's Mailbag came out. Without further ado, here's Jonathan Stokey. We're joined for the first time by Jonathan Stokey, host of the Baseline Intelligence podcast for the first ever Coach's Mailbag. Very excited to do this, and and you are just the perfect guest to start this off because I've been enjoying your podcast for a while where you bring on great uh, coaches and great tennis minds in general. And at the end of, of most of the interviews, you go to Instagram and ask and uh, take some questions from some of your listeners. So uh, you know you know what you're doing here, is the, and that's that's why you're a perfect first guest. I was telling you before, it's it's like cheating when you when you ask your audience to figure out all the great questions that you can ask. It's like, I, I don't have to do anything. I can just get a good guest on the show. They ask great questions, and then the guest, guest gives a great answer. So super easy on my end. Well, you also clearly bring so much to the table on your own when it comes to uh, Tennis Insights. So excited to get into this. And also, you get to draw from a lot of the great minds that you have interviewed over the years on Baseline Intelligence. So um, thanks for coming on. Let's get into it. Right. Uh, this first question is not a creative one, but it is probably one that I see among the most when it comes to the intersection of what we're seeing in the pro game and how that affects development and, and what uh, recreational players, especially younger players, are doing, and it has to do with the one-handed backhand. Uh, it comes from Bruno. Is there still a place for one-handed backhands in the modern game, or will it always be a weakness despite its more meaningful power? And let me just also provide some context here. It's a great week to be answering this question, because as the pros play in Rotterdam, Jonathan, Stefanos Tsitsipas is under threat of leaving the top 10. If that happens, and Grigor Dimitrov, who has a chance to enter the top 10, does not, it will be the first time in the history of the ranking system that there is no one-handed backhand in the ATP top 10. So is the question, is the one-hander uh, becoming obsolete of the pro game or just in the game in general? For like a recreational player, if they came to me and said, hey, I'd love to start with a one-hand backhand, I'm like, awesome, great. Yeah. You know, you can chip it. You can, I mean, most people are just trying to make their backhand at the three, five, four, oh level. So if you, can you make it with a one hander or a two hander? Absolutely. Now, as the level goes up, like I know as a player, I used to feed, I see a one hand backhand guy in the draw and I'm like, I'm going to roll high heavies to that side. I'm going to kick it to that side, serve and volley. And that player is going to have to move like crazy. So they're not hitting the ball up here. Whereas a two hander could kind of jump on one leg hit that ball above their shoulder and still get some good pace on it. So, I mean, I think you are seeing there, there's a reason why there are not many one hand backhand players dominating on the tour right now. That That is for sure. But then if you take it to your local club, 
of course you can hit a one-hander backhand and be successful yourself, if that makes sense. Yeah. There is, in the pro game, there is a real advantage to the RPMs that you can generate on a one-hander. And that's one of the reasons I've always kind of had hope or I, I don't know, hope, right? Because it's okay if, if the one-hander goes obsolete, although people love to watch it. And I think most people are rooting for it to be a presence on tour for decades and decades and decades to come. But as far as the baseline game is concerned and just generating heaviness and weight of shot, nobody is able to do what Stan and team and, and Gaz K and Shapovalov no two handers are really hitting with that kind of uh, RPM. So I think that is one area where you can look to it and you can say, Leah, it might actually be an asset for pro players. And then the other thing is, and I'm, I'm really curious what you think of this, the way my coach, Chris Lewitt, would go about it when it came to young players is, do you have an active or do you have a right hand dominant backhand? So I, I saw some players who had two handers, but the left arm, and obviously we're talking about righties, the left arm was just kind of along for the ride. And you could see that it was really a right arm dominant backhand. And when you have a player whose natural inclination is to hit the backhand with you know right arm dominance, is the left arm actually just getting in the way? Like, is it is it more of a hindrance? And is that a player who really should be hitting a one-hander? It's an interesting question because I was very left-hand dominant. And so I had a great backhand. It was much better than my forehand in terms of just consistency. And so, yeah, I'm trying to visualize if my right hand was super dominant, why, what is, what is the reason for using that left hand? Like it's just restricting a lot of things. It's not adding much. So I would agree with you there. The only thing I would say when you were talking about the RPMs or the ability to generate pace with the one-hander is like a guy like Stan. Okay, that that's great. That is true. But it comes down to like what wins matches. So is he winning with his attacking off his backhand side? He's definitely winning points. Is that the biggest piece of the pie for him that he can generate those extra RPMs? I would argue probably not. It's still going to come down to his serve. It's still going to come down to his forehand and his runaround forehand. It's still going to come down to putting returns in play, hopefully with depth. So while that's true, I think it's just a, a small piece of the pie that really doesn't matter. And I also think the backhand's main role is to be solid on defense. And so if you can play solid defense with two hands and get the ball deep and counterpunch, I would argue that's almost more important than, hey, here's one ball that you could attack that you weren't able to run around. And this is where it'd be nice if we got more speed. I just don't think that situation comes up enough to kind of make up for those pros and cons on the one-hander. Yeah, that's such a good point. I had the chance to interview Stan at the U.S. Open. I asked him, if you have an attackable ball, do you prefer it on your forehand or your backhand? And he gave the answer that I expected. He said, I, I'd rather the ball on my forehand. I, I open up angles better on that side, and especially inside the court, I'm much more comfortable finishing with the forehand. And we're talking about probably the best offensive one-hander in the history of the game. Um, that's a great point. All right, let's go to a question that's kind of similar but it, it got a lot of likes and it's another topical one because there was a viral video recently of uh, a player named Teodor Davidov, who's a 13 year old and he plays with two forehands. So this next one is from Paul. Uh, would two forehands actually be possible to execute at the highest level of tennis? What technical issues would you have to overcome to make it work? Have you ever thought about this one, Jonathan? I mean, it's pretty left field. It's pretty out there. Yeah, I mean, I think about everything. I, I, I love it. Um, to answer first, to answer the question, I, I say yes, it's possible. A big reason why you haven't seen it is because how many people start practicing that from the age of 10 or 11 or whenever Theodore would have to start or whenever you would have to start to actually have that be an option. So the sample size is so small, that pot of people who actually would practice it, do we know if that would hold up? Like right now, almost everybody has a one hand forehand and a two hand backhand. So we know that can work, but there's hundreds of thousands of great juniors who are using those strokes. So if we had 100,000 people for, you know, whatever, even 20,000 people practice two forehands, could one of them get in the top 10? Absolutely. It's just right now that, I mean, how many people are actually working on that in junior tennis? I can't imagine it's more than like 100. 
Yeah, and and it's a continuation of our conversation. Obviously, the reason why it's appealing is because the forehand is the the weapon off the ground for for most players, especially on the men's side. So if you can if you can bring two of them to the table, that's uh, that's pretty intriguing. Obviously, and I don't know if you've read comment sections. You know, Theodore has been out there on the internet uh, for a few years now. A lot of naysayers. A lot of folks like this can't work once the ball is coming really, really quickly. Obviously, you have a grips thing here, but I disagree with all of the naysaying. And I, I think it's interesting the way Theodore is doing it uh, is is not a top hand, bottom hand situation, which I think is essential. If you have a top hand and a bottom hand on your grip and you have to flip it, uh, otherwise you're hitting a forehand choked up on the racket, which has its certainly its downsides. You're losing something there. Um, if you have to flip it, I think that's a problem. But what he's doing is kind of gripping with both hands on the bottom and then figuring out a way to go to his forehand grip, left hand, right hand, and he has his hand in the right spot. To me, he's doing it extremely well. Yeah, so the thing about switching grips, okay, so I was taught one volley grip, continental. And I know people out there have different forehand and backhand volley grips. And so when someone says, oh, well, you just, when you're turning, you just switch it for a backhand volley. I'm like, well, how in the hell do you do that? But guess what? People do it all the time. So to me, that seems impossible. Many pros on tour do that with ease because they've always practiced that. So for someone to say, I mean, people switch grips on returns and it's 130 miles an hour. So I'm, you know, I I don't buy into that. Oh, he's not going to be able to switch grips. Maybe on return to serve, he would have to come up with an option where he's blocking on one side and he's mixing it up so the person doesn't know. But like, if that's the biggest thing is, man, we're not going to be able to switch grips in time. People switch grips on some weird stuff with some really fast balls. And if you can't do it, that doesn't mean it can't be done. Yeah, terrific point. You just made me think of uh, my friend, Jan Michael Gamble, who hit a two-handed forehand on both sides. But for the return, the ball did come too fast. And a lot of the time he went to to one hand on on the return of serve, I think on his right side for the forehand, became a top 15, you know, was a top 15 player in the world. Um, so it made me think of that. Good point there. Uh, let's go to the next one. The question is, wow, this is a big one to start. How do I win matches? I am technically better, quote unquote, better than many of the players I have lost to in close matches. Obviously, it has to do with unforced errors, but what mental components are there? Can I even say I'm technically better than players that can beat me? Uh, uh, okay. I was, I was, I was I'm- listening to your podcast with, uh, um, this week with uh, Jay Berger. And mm-hmm. you made a comment about how a lot of players are coming to you after losing matches and saying, Jonathan, I was better, but they lost. Yeah, uh, t- I'm glad he threw that in there. No, you cannot say you're better than the people that are beating you. Like, so I step on the court to play a tennis match against you. And the goal is to win two sets. That's the point of the game. The, the, the goal of the game is not to win more points. It's not to win more games necessarily. It's to win two sets. And so if I walk on the court and you win two sets against me, I can't go, you know what, though? I'm better at that than you. I might do things better than you. So I might hit a cleaner ball. That might be what he's referring to, which I think most people, I hit the ball better than you. Right. That can be true. But you can also hit the ball better and be a worse tennis player. And that is what it sounds like might be happening with him, is that he he views his strokes and his athleticism and all the things he can see and feel and goes, I do those things better than my opponent, and yet I walk off with a loss. And that is a very, very common thing. And I feel like people need to understand that the things you don't see, the mindset, the tactics, the feel, and and kind of navigating a match, that is like massively important to your overall success. Yeah, 100%. Uh, So I guess the advice that I would give to this person it probably starts with with ego, to be honest. And I think it's been a long time since I read Winning Ugly, the Brad Gilbert book, but I think he had a chapter in there about beating pushers. And what stuck with me is I I think, and again, God, it was a long time when I a long time ago when I read this. But the first thing that he said is when you're playing a pusher, leave your ego to the side. Because so often the first thing is 
this this player who I'm facing has no offense, has no skill in terms of hitting aggressive shots, and therefore I am better and I should beat them. And I don't think that's a great mindset to come out onto court with, with I should win. No, th- this player presents certain challenges and you need to take those challenges seriously and also not care how you're winning points, right? Because I think sometimes players get even more aggressive when they take on somebody who's pushing the ball into the court. And it's, no, don't get more aggressive. They're not hurting you. If anything, you need to be more patient. You need to match them there because the way they're going to beat you is if you miss. So I love golf. I just love playing golf, period. But I also love playing it because it gets me in the mindset of an amateur player because I am not a golf expert, even though I did marry a golf coach. And so I got to uh, interview one of my favorite golf coaches. It's going to be on the podcast, so I'll be interested if people are interested in what he has to say, because a lot of golf and tennis carries over. But what he said was, if you walk off the golf course and you think you should have shot a lower score than what you did, one of two things is true. You are not as good as you think you are, or you made a tactical error. That's it. You either either think you should be shooting 68, but you really shot 74, or you look back on your round, you're like, oh, I was so stupid. I did things I know I shouldn't be doing. And that, to me, very much applies to tennis. I walked off the court and I lost to a guy I should have beat. So Mm -hmm. either I have misevaluated my skill level to his and I'm just wrong, or I walked off the court and I was like, I kept going down the line for no reason and missing balls in the net and doing X, Y, and Z, and I know I shouldn't do that. Those are the two ways that you lose a match you should win. Yeah. That My guess is this, this guy who left the question would fall into one of those two buckets. Yeah, and and I think the the bad decision making that comes into play is probably the thing that you want to make sure to get under control first. Um, I mean, o- overrating yourself as a player, okay, uh, it it happens. But we let's, all do it. We all do yeah, it. Yeah, exactly. But let's uh, definitely focus on if if I guess the advice would be focus on the the decision making. Don't let your emotions or your egos get in the way of making. Uh, those good decisions. So, so I'll actually answer the question after I just told this guy okay. he's not as good as he thinks he is. But, but my my general feeling on winning matches, and a lot of people view this as, I don't want them to view it from a scared or tentative standpoint about what I'm going to say. But to win more, in my opinion, especially at the recreational level, you got to learn how to lose less. Yeah. So, what loses a match? Missed returns, double faults. Ground strokes in the net from behind the baseline. Ground strokes wide. Missing plus one balls, right? And changing directions for no reason. And if you go through a match, you go, man, I made a lot of returns. I didn't throw in a bunch of double faults. If I missed, I was missing deep through the middle. You either lost because that guy is way better than you, or you didn't lose. Like, I can look at any match that I've ever watched my players, and when they're playing a bad match, those those five, six errors that I just mentioned are just piling up on repeat in bunches. It's not, do I hit more winners? How do I hit deeper? Those things matter a little bit, but it's usually the elimination of those mistakes instead of the addition of these incredible shots or winners. Love that. I Would you say that that is almost 95, 100% true, let's say at the, the 4-0 level, and below and then even at the pro level it's still like 60 percent there i i would argue even maybe more i mean i know that at the pro level the serve can set things up a little differently but once you watch these pros get into the four or five shot rally and the serve has kind of been negated you're gonna watch the same thing of course there are some incredible shots but i would love maybe i'll do this in my spare time but like someone to edit a match and just show the winner's worst points like whoever won the match, just show the the 70 points that they played that were awful because we know they missed in a five set match. We know they missed like 50, 60, 70 balls. And you're going to watch him and you're going to go, that was, that was not a great error. Like he just hit in the net for no reason or he yeah. just missed an easy overhead. And so, yeah, I do think that holds up to an extent at the pro, not quite as much because amateurs really can't punish an average ball, whereas a pro can. But I still see pros mess up those average shots a fair amount. So I do think the same thing applies. This next one is from Leo F. 
Hi, Gil. I want to talk about sliding on hard courts. I personally can slide very well on hard court, including my open stance backhand at a club level, of course. When my friends ask me how, I cannot give them a good answer besides its instincts. Trust in yourself and get more speed and momentum. I feel like it's an instantaneous moment of commitment where it just feels right to do it then. Can you explain how sliding on hard courts can be taught? Thanks a lot. I'm going to slightly alter the the first part of this question, Jonathan, and ask you, should sliding on hard courts be taught at all? Not how can it, but should it? It's a great question. I, I was To answer the question, no, I cannot tell you how to teach that because as a player, I could always slide on my right foot on a hard court, but I couldn't slide off my left. So he's talking about an open stance backhand, like you always see Djokovic doing it. That just feels, I can actually see my ACL snapping in half when I visualize myself sliding on my left. And yet some people do with ease. I would argue, you know, again, at the recreational level, is a, is sliding into a backhand necessary? Like if I have an hour with a player and I can think of serves, returns coming to the net, I don't know where sliding into my backhand would fall in that piece of the pie as a necessary thing to win. I think it's something, like you said, you have to have some level of speed and obviously it can help with the pros because they can recover a step quicker and I get all that. But I know plenty of pros who I've talked to who are kind of the same way. They're like, on my left leg, it doesn't feel natural. On my right leg, I trust it. I can slide into it. I can slide after. I can slide into a one-hand slice. But with the left leg, they just don't feel that balance and that control. And so I don't have a good answer for that one. I don't know how to teach the lefty backhand slice or sliding shot, but I also wouldn't even waste time with it, to be honest. Yeah, and I'm I'm right there with you. I don't slide on hard court. Uh, it's It's scary to me. A lot of pros don't do it. I will say watching Yannick Sinner, especially in the last five, six months, do I think at the highest level possible, is there something to be said for the ability to do it? Yeah. And I don't know if it's been, I don't know if enough attention, honestly, has been put onto Sinner's ability to do this because the the frequency at which he's sliding on the hard courts when he's on the run to me is higher than Djokovic and Novak has gotten a lot of publicity for it especially because he does bring those highlight real open stance backhands and I would say maybe it might be his his signature shot singularly but a lot there's subtleties to the way Sinner is doing it almost like point in and point out when he's moving into the corners. And to me, it's probably given him a fraction of a second on every single recovery and the body control and the balance when he's actually having to hit the shot is exceptional. So yeah, I think if you have that ability, it's awesome. But what percent of players on this planet are really going to be able to do that? Right. And the only other thing I'd say is it's it's similar-ish to how you would slide on a clay court. So if I go out wide for an open stance backhand and I got a lot of weight over my leg, I'm not going to be sliding. My foot's just going to get stuck in the ground, right? I've got all the weight on the toe. So it's a similar idea. It's just in my mind that doesn't compute. It doesn't make sense. And so I approach that very tentatively and then there's no way I'm going to slide. Like there's full commitment from a center. I'm stretched out. I'm sliding into this thing. There's no hesitation. You hesitate one little bit and it's not going to happen. Yep. Here's a very interesting one that I did not expect. It's from E. Colder. What are the pros and cons of using a ball machine to practice? Any tips on best uses? Yeah, so there are tons of pros and cons. Um, the pros, going back to my golf guy, Scott Fawcett, he's from Decade Golf, but he's big on block practice at times. So if you're just working on a new technique with your volley, with your ground stroke, yeah, the ball's just coming at you. It is not realistic at all whatsoever to a point, but you are getting the brain memory of here's my low to high or here is my new grip. And you can rep that all day. And there is a absolutely a benefit to that. Um, so some ball machines out there now can make it one step more realistic and you can have certain patterns. So you can go, oh, I'm going to go two cross, one line, and then they would probably hit a backhand cross. So I can simulate that shot. And then you can work on your technique in those areas. But for me, the ball machine is purely like a block practice instrument. I need to work on a certain technique. I need the ball coming in a similar-ish area, and I just want to see if I can groove it, knowing that when you get to real points, it's all about adjusting and improvising. 
but you have to have those fundamental basics. And sometimes it's difficult to work on those if you're hitting with someone else and the ball is going one high, one low, one fast, one slice. Each one of those shots is different. So you're not really practicing that, that, that stroke that you want. So I would absolutely be using it for a technical change to get extra reps in. Yeah, I, I like that a lot. I, I think financially, obviously a coach should be able to provide the same thing with hand feed uh, or or even kind of a more of a live ball feed. But I guess financially in the long term, a ball machine might give you the ability to do it, you know, three times a week instead of one time a week. So so there are certainly those benefits. And also one thing I I think might be beneficial when you're training something you don't have somebody on the other end of the court where you need to feel bad about missing too much or something like that. Like if you want to drill, let's say backhand approach shots, it's really hard to get somebody, uh, especially if they're not a paid coach to like drill you backhand approach shots where you're going to what just hit winners on uh, half of them miss another 30% and like maybe the other player has a play on the ball like the other 20% I might have screwed up that math. Uh, so the fact that there's no human who can who who's on the other side like, hey, can you like give me a little practice here? I think that's also a benefit. A little side note too, a lot of people want to always practice with someone better. And I found that I improved my most and the fastest when I played with people worse than me. For that very reason. So I'm working on a slice, okay? And I was, let's say I was top 10 in the 18s. And yeah. I'm playing with a local 16-year-old state player. He's thrilled to be on the court with me. He's pumped. So I'm not worried about ruining his practice. He's like, oh, he's all excited to be there with me. So I can work on my slice. And if I hit a bad one or two, whatever. He, he doesn't care. He's, he's happy to be on the court. If I was working on my slice with someone way better than me, I wouldn't be able to do it. Because I, I do, I want to make sure their practice is good. I want them to hit with me more. And that's not really conducive to working on the skills. So that's another thing. If you don't have a ball machine, I'd call up someone who's a level below you and be like, hey, do you want to go hit in practice? I want to work on some backhands cross or whatever. And they're going to say yes, because most people want to hit with that someone who's better. And then you can kind of work on that live ball. So that would kind of be the next addition to the ball machine. Mm -hmm. Use people who are a little lower than you as a, as a way to practice as well. I uh I got a ball machine for a birthday gift when I was younger. I don't think I used it enough for it to ultimately make sense. And uh, one thing I kind of struggled with was just the rhythm of it. Just not not seeing the ball come off a racket and obviously that throws off the timing of when you split step and how you set up for the ball. I never really enjoyed that, but I imagine other players have had experiences, maybe a different machine, maybe just finding the things uh, to drill where they don't care so much about the footwork aspect of it. But I struggled with that. Yeah. I mean, I, and I get that. And, you know, if you, many people out there haven't seen me hit a ground stroke and there's a reason for that because uh, actually I was just in uh, IMG and Jimmy Arias said it's next level effed up. My, uh, <laughs> my take back. That, well, uh, knowing, knowing Jimmy, you know, I am sure yeah. he said that to a lot of people. Yeah. Now, now I do, I, I hit my forehand. Well, it is just not pretty. Right. So if I take a shadow swing, my forehand looks perfect. If a ball is moving at me faster than one miles an hour, I can't make that same swing. And so that's where even a ball machine where it's not realistic and my timing on the split might be different. That's where if I really wanted to go change my forehand take back right now, it would really help me to have a ball moving. And then I can see if I can take that racket back high Whereas I can shadow swing that all day, but the second a live bullet comes my way, I take it back straight and flat. So yes, I see what you're saying for footwork. It's a very awkward thing, but for just the technical side, I still think it could be a huge benefit. Okay. Here's one that plays off of that because it's about technique, especially funky looking technique. It comes from Tsugumi. We often talk about how unorthodox Medvedev's technique is, but which area is his game actually technically sound? Surely as an established top 10 player, he got to have some stroke mechanics that are fundamentally correct. Or is it this unorthodox playing style and work ethic that made him stay at the top for this long? I, I wonder sometimes, Jonathan, if the hyper fixation with technique when it comes to watching pros is on the take back and the follow through and a lot in between that might get lost. 
And I, I wonder just in between the take back and the follow through, how much of what Medvedev is doing is completely normal? Well, I mean, we know it's normal because look how well he hits the ball. I mean, it, it's all the same. So I think Agassi called it like the 12 inches of truth. It was like the six inches behind the ball and the six inches past. I guarantee you on Medvedev's forehand and backhand, he is swinging slightly low to high at a minimum. He's reaching contact. He's either vertical or slightly closed. And then he's going on a low to high path. Now, if he takes his racket back funky, okay. Like that could make it more difficult to get into that position. But if he can get there, Right. I mean, if you saw my take back, you would think I'm a public park recreational, have never played tennis before. I can hit a really good forehand even still because I swing low to high and I get my racket vertical. I do it in a very inefficient way. So I think it was Andy Fitzell. This is a video podcast, right? Yes. He said, like he said, oh, you can scratch your left ear this way or you can scratch it like this. <laughs> OK, I got the, I scratched the itch both times. That's so good. One of them looks pretty easy to do. And so Medvedev might be doing things that you'd go, man, it'd be a lot, he'd make his life a lot easier if he just took it back like this. Okay, that's true. But that moment of truth at impact, he's right on the money. And that's mm -hmm. why he never misses and he's lacing ground strokes. So he's balanced. He's getting the ball in the right spot. He's swinging low to high. His racket's vertical. We see all different types of grips, all different types of takebacks, even the serve, which is the thing you control the most. I see different toss heights, I see different windups. And they all can hit great balls. So there's no one correct way to do it. But if you watch these people, they do have the same fundamentals. What about the follow through aspect of it? There was a viral clip at the Australian Open where Medvedev ended up, you know, windshield wiper like this. And then oftentimes I see him do the, I, I don't even know what to call it. It's almost like the, you're, you're teaching beginners and you you show them how to follow through and you say go go above the opposite shoulder like here like you're scratching your back or something and then in reality none of the pros follow through there almost everyone follows through on their shoulder sometimes even lower and sometimes medvedev is really like wrapping his uh his elbow around his neck like he's going to choke himself um how much like when you've spoken to coaches and and in your own experience when it comes to technique how do you how do you reckon with the concept of a follow through considering you've already hit the ball well let me ask you a question first for you how important do you think a follow through is or or why is it important why do why is a follow through important i i feel the importance in my body like i know when i hit my two hander and i don't finish there's a chance that it flies on me. I've, you know, I've felt that before. Mm -hmm. um, on the forehand, it's never been something that I've thought about the the finish. It's just, be and that's because my forehand is very natural to me. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think there might be within that six inches, maybe of what what do you call it? The the moment six, of truth or the uh, moment uh, of yeah, truth. I guess he called it something. It was like the moment of truth. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I I, I suppose when you have the wrong finish, I guess maybe it can affect the back end of that, of those six inches. Right. So the way it was explained to me, and by the way, I, I a follow through matters, but this is how I, this is how it matters to me. So if I got the ball, right. And I'm coming in to hit it. And that ball has now left my racket. Does the ball know if I'm doing a windshield wiper or a standard, the ball is gone. The impact, everything that I did before has sent the ball on its way. So as that ball is traveling, if I, at the last second, want to do this, does that make the ball drop randomly? No. No, exactly. So why a low to high when people say, oh, catch that ball, you know, catch the racket above here. Well, what that ensures is that I will be swinging up on the ball. I mean, I'm not going to swing down and then fake it like this. That's very difficult to do. So when someone says, hey, let's make sure we get that good follow through, we're ensuring that leading up into the ball we're going to be doing the correct thing. And so Federer, if you see someone finish low, they're swinging low to high, they get past the ball, and then they just relax, mm -hmm. right? And they let that racket go low. That's fine. At the moment of truth, they were doing what they needed to do, clearly, because they were hitting a great forehand. Where the low follow-through is an issue is if people are just swinging straight down on the ball to get to that low follow-through, right? And so now yeah. at the moment of truth, they're not swinging low to high, they're swinging high to low, and that's the issue. But the ball doesn't know what you're doing once it leaves your racket. 
So it those, those late buggy whips, that could be because he's late. That could be because he's nervous. That could be because he's just always done it and it's his flair. But it really isn't having an impact on the ball once he struck it. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Uh, while we're on the Medvedev topic, let's go to this one. Love Medvedev. How can some people be jacked and some people be Medvedev, but hit the ball at a comparable rate of speed? I'm sure this is a question you get. It's it's one of the most mystifying and also essential questions in tennis, which is where does power come from? But from a very young age, I noticed as a as a smaller kid, um, oh, wow, this is a sport where you don't have to be a giant and you can still have enough power. And I didn't feel that way when I was playing baseball, Jonathan, and I could only hit a single and my my buddies were hitting dingers and doubles. I just didn't feel that way. But in tennis, mm-hmm. you, you have the access to that power. So where where would you say the power comes from? How can you look like Medvedev and hit big? Or how could you be uh, the the guy who spends two hours lifting and then goes onto the court and they don't they don't hit big? So I was just visiting uh, Jesse Pagula down in Florida. I was there with her her for a week and I hadn't seen her hit up close in a long time. And she was absolutely destroying the ball and she is not big and she is strong, but it's, you know, she's not some, you know, muscle goon where you're going, Oh, I can totally understand why she rips it. There's a technique and a timing, right? So she is hitting that sixth or seventh string from the top of the racket, right in the sweet spot. Every time, if you swing really fast and hit it four strings off the sweet spot, it's not going to come off with any ball speed. It's just not. And if your racket face is open, well, you're not going to swing fast instinctively because that ball is going to go over the back fence, right? So there is that moment of truth of having your racket vertical and making sure you're swinging low to high that gives you the freedom to accelerate. For me, I think about having loose hands, right? So I'm rotating in the ball, but my hands are loose. When people are tight and they're trying to control their shots, you can't swing fast when you're tight. So it does all go to better to go together. Obviously, you have rotation. Obviously, you can use your legs. But for me, the cleanliness of the strike is the most important thing because that's where you see people swinging so smooth, but the ball jumps off the racket because they're getting everything out of their motion versus people who are swinging out of their shoes, but it's inefficient. It's just a lot of wasted energy. The timing is perfect. The kinetic chain is efficient and it's there and you're using your big muscles. Uh, a word I've been hearing a ton recently is elasticity. Oh, that person, their swing is elastic. Uh, there's a, a certain stretchiness to it. And um, I I like that word, but I don't know how well I can explain what that word means. Wh- where are you I, on elasticity? Right when you said it, I was just like, oh, so loose. Yeah. Like that, that's how I, if you're loose, I mean, yeah, you get that little whip, depending on where you are, you'll get lag, whatever it might be. When you're rigid, I mean, it's just robotic. There's there's not going to be any elasticity. So the more relaxed you are with your upper body, the more relaxed you are with your hands and just kind of let it happen, you're going to have that elasticity, that racket speed. And then hopefully your technique is good enough so that when you're relaxed, your racket's getting the right position and not like strings wide open or something like that. But yeah, you say that word and I just heard loose. Right. And, and maybe also a, a level of continuity in your technique. Because if it stops, I think it's also hard to be elastic. And when you have the continuity, you you build certain momentums, I would say, within the technique. Like, I think on a serve, I see a lot of players with huge serves getting a lot of momentum into their racket drop. And it probably gives them an ability to, to just go back a little bit further in almost that back scratch moment where you're about to accelerate up um, into the ball, but in, in that moment, your your racket head is facing completely down towards the court. Um, like if you stop at the trophy position like a statue, you're likely not going to be able to get as violent a racket drop as if you are like Ben Shelton or Chris Eubanks and you're flowing through that trophy position into your racket drop. Fair to say. Okay, so I I will I will not hijack your podcast and talk about the lower first serve toss. But that's exactly why only tossing a little higher than you need to reach is ideal. Because if I ask you to swing as fast as you can on a serve, you'll be relaxed and you will do a continuous motion without a ball, without a ball. Mm -hmm. If I ask you to shadow a forehand and go swing as fast as you can, there's not going to be some huge pause anywhere. You're going to take it back and you're going to rip. And you go, cool, that's how you swing your fastest. You instinctively know that. 
So why do people pause? Well, on their serve, they pause because they toss really high. There's no other reason. They're used to it. And so they think they like it because of that, but there's no other reason. And if you can learn how to time your take back so it's smooth and let gravity work on a ground stroke, that's how you can time it. But that continuous motion is huge. Once you stop your momentum, you're starting from scratch again, which is not ideal. Yeah. Unless you're Arthur uh, Cazot. That's the guy who uh, I've been talking yeah. about his serve and how it goes 140 and he's not tall and he's not very fluid. It's unbelievable. Well, the thing is, too, again, watching pros, because I do this with golf, my wife coach golf, and it's like, I can find an ex uh, uh, exception to every rule. Yeah. I mean, is it Del Bonus who tosses it like 50 feet in the air? The lefty? His serve isn't a good example of a good pro serve, but yes. Right, exactly. exactly. But but people go, well, yeah, I mean, he, he serves, he hits aces at the pro level, and look at what he, I mean, he does it, or Delpo tossed high, or yeah. whatever. You can find a ton of people who do everything, mm -hmm. and that doesn't make it the best way. They can still be great players. Like we've talked about Medvedev, I'm sure there are some things if he could improve just right now magically, he would. But it might be a little too late to work on some crazy technical things. So yeah, th there are exceptions to every rule. And the people who like to continue doing what they're doing will find those exceptions and go, that is why I'm not going to change. And that is why they will stay the same level. Love it. All right. Uh, let's go to a question about elite player weaknesses from Alex. Hey, yo, why is it that some players can have elite level aspects of their game and then have another aspect of their game that is a couple of steps below this with seemingly limited ability to improve upon these poorer aspects? Is this technique, training, natural talent, uh, or for some things above others, mental or something else? This is, a, this is a fascinating question. I think a lot of people wonder about this. It's essentially, and I think it's in other sports too, how can you be a pro, you do all of these things great, but I don't know, you're Matteo Berrettini, your, your two-hander just isn't there. Uh, how does that happen? Why aren't you able to fix those things? It's a big philosophical question, I would yeah. say. Yeah, I mean, it's like, I mean, if, if you could be good at chess, why can't you be good at other strategical games? Like the backhand is a totally different shot than a forehand. And some things make sense. When you, know, when you hear something in your mind, some things make more sense than others. You know, mm -hmm. like if you talk to me about drop volleys, I mean, I, I had an, my slice lob. I mean, I'll never, I will always put a slice lob a yard from the baseline until I die. <laughs> I still have that. That makes total sense to me. Okay. But taking my racket up high on a forehand doesn't make sense in my mind. I can't see the picture. And I've wondered this too, because I go, I'm a great athlete. I, I mean, I played in the US Open when I was 17 and I can't take my racket back high on a forehand. I mean, there are millions of people who can do this and I can't, I struggle. That's just something that doesn't add up for me. Now, the question is, after a while, do people work on their strengths or their weaknesses? So they might have that weakness that's built up over time and go, guess what? Yeah, I know it's weird and it seems odd that I can't make my backhand, but guess what? It doesn't really matter. I'm winning my, mat I'm winning my match. So who cares if this one shot I seemingly can't hit? Mm -hmm. It's all good. It doesn't matter. Or it matters enough. And so they've already fixed it, you know, because everyone has their own innate strength or weakness. And then as a player and as a coach, as you're developing, you decide, does it matter that I can't hit a drop volley? I'll bet you there's a lot. I mean, how many women on the WTA tour have a phenomenal drop volley? Probably not many, you know, you don't see it mm -hmm. hit that much. Yeah. And so you go, man, why can't they hit drop volleys? They can hit normal volleys. You'd be like, well, it th doesn't make sense in their mind. And on top of that, they don't practice it anymore. So I think it's a mixture of those two, but to me, it's totally understandable. I mean, a backhand and a forehand volley have nothing in common besides yeah. I'm holding a racket. So it's all, all unique to the player. The other thing I'd add to that is you take any weakness in the pro game pretty much like we can even take a famous one and say Ernest Golbus's forehand or even at a, a much I'd say higher level, like this is a better weakness, but Tsitsipas's backhand, which is heavily scrutinized. If you take a normal sample of, of tennis players, this is, Golbus's forehand is awesome. Tsitsipas's backhand is awesome, right? It's not as if they're doing these things at sub-professional levels, but you are comparing them to the best forehands in the world, the best backhands in the world. They're at the pro level. So I think the way, one of the ways to explain how these incredible athletes and incredible players have these weaknesses that they can never solve is 
well, they, there's an extent to which their weaknesses, they are still great at these things, but they're truly going up against the cream of the crop. And that is when they look weak. Is that yeah, fair? And, yeah. Oh yeah. And, and also, like I said, you're just getting up into like how the brain works. So like Patrick Mahomes, right? He just won the Super Bowl. Is he equally as great at every throw on the football field? Five yard screen, 10 yard out, 50 yard bomb. He has something he's better at. Mm-hmm. And again, his weakness might not look that big compared to someone else's, but yeah, I, I I don't stress if something with my own game and I don't feel weird when I watch a pro and go, God, like how do they not how do they not hit that? Their their weakest shot on the pro level is still damn good. It just might not be as good as their best shot. And by like if we don't have this, then what's the other answer? That every aspect of everyone's game would be exactly the same. Mm-hmm. You serve just as good as you hit your forehand, just as good as you hit your backhand. And that is your level. Everybody has something they do great. Everything has, has something they need to hide. And that is just the normal flow of sports, for sure. NBA players get this a lot with free throws, where everyone's like, how do you not make a free throw? Well, be, they're 6'9", and they dunk on people, so they can right. miss free throws. Yeah, and you're, you're taking a shot where you're completely stationary and everyone's looking at you. That's a completely different shot than an in-game, in-rhythm catching a ball off a pass, like it's it's not the same. And so if some people struggle with that, to me, it makes total sense. Last one. This is a little bit more granular, less uh, philosophical. Comes from ta- uh, Trailer. I thought it was Taylor, but it says Trailer. Hello, Mr. Gross. Why has Djokovic become almost known to hit slice second serves to forehands instead of the more common kick to the backhand? Also, uh, Okay, I'm actually going to skip the second part of this one. I I want to I want to talk about that. That that's really interesting to me. Just the Djokovic. I'll answer the question. The reason he's become known for that is because that is the second serve he's hitting uh, more so than the kick to the backhand. It's something that I've covered a lot. What is your view on the the second serve? Like, is there because traditionally and especially when I was getting coached, it was look, you got to hit a kick serve to the backhand. Like that's your second serve uh, if you're playing a righty. And um, I'm seeing more and more pros. Sinner and Djokovic, I think, are are up there, although Sinner has a pretty good kicker. Djokovic has a pretty good kicker, too. A lot of them are, are choosing to slice and choosing to slice into the forehand. What do you make of that? I mean, obviously, if you attack a forehand, if you hit a little bit of a bigger serve and it goes to the forehand, you might get some more free points. Yeah. If you kick it to the backhand body, guys can easily run around that anyway. So it's still going to be a forehand a fair amount of times. I think if you ask any returner who was going to attack a second serve and said, what do you not want the server to do? Okay. My guess, because this is what I would say, is I don't want them to give me something different. I want to know what's coming. I want to know it's a kicker to the back. If if it's a great serve, I just want to know because I can plan for it. And so is he going exclusively forehand body? Is he going exclusively with the same speed on the second serve? I think the best servers have more options and can see what's working and can keep the returner off balance. So I know, I think it was O'Shaughnessy who said a lot of the errors come from A, position A in the court, in the deuce court, where you're attacking a forehand and people can't defend on that side. So I think there's an element of that. And I think there's an element of, I'm going to do something you're not comfortable with. And then once you get used to that, I will spin one in the back end. And then I'll go back to the forehand and you're going to have to react to me instead of being able to plan what you want to do. Yeah, that's such a great point, especially because when it comes to the kick serve, you need to make an adjustment for height. And like any anyone will say, you either need to move up, take it on the rise so that you catch it in your strike zone, or you need to move back and let it drop. When you start mixing, not just spins, not just locations, but heights, uh, now you completely, you throw that off, you give them less looks at the kick serve, so they're less likely to, you know, really be in the ideal position for it. And uh, the other thing that I also think has to do with height, when it comes to the slice serve, if you can hit it consistently as your second serve and get the ball to stay low, that is such a great way to be unattackable at at any level is to just keep the ball low. And it's it's something that I I harp on a lot when I'm analyzing because I think the battle of heights in the pro game is actually one of the essential battles that these guys are fighting. And uh, good luck attacking a second serve when the ball's at your knees. Yep. And it, it, like you said earlier, the fascination with the kick serve, because a lot of people come to me and I say, I want to learn that. And I'm like, okay, I can I can try to help you that. What, why do you want to learn a kick serve? And there's really not a great reason other than it's like people kind of thought that 
what you're supposed to do on a second serve kick. Like I had topspin, but I would say I had more like slice topspin on my serve. So I can yeah. hit it really fast. And we kind of leak in this way. And I go, does it really matter if it's leaking into their body or if it's extended a foot away? I mean, is that really such a monumental difference? Sure, for certain players, maybe. But like, I, I don't personally subscribe to the philosophy of like the kick serve is like this incredible thing. To me, it's variety. And we've already spoken about Medvedev. Like if I was trying to attack his serve, that dude might serve 130 on a second serve. Like, I have no idea what's going on. Like, how do I, how do I even plan for that? He just blows that up because I can go one big T, I can go big wide, I can go slow body, I can hit a slice. And so I just think that variety is huge if you want to keep people off balance. All right, this was absolutely incredible. Uh, listen to the Baseline Intelligence podcast with Jonathan Stokey. Jonathan, um, thanks for coming on and let, let the viewers and listeners know if there's anything they should be looking out for in particular. Yeah, I mean, I'm always on Instagram posting like a quick tip. And I actually started a YouTube channel maybe about a month ago. And so I'm trying to do some longer lessons. Yeah. I know people sometimes don't want like a 20 second tip. They want a little more explanation. So um, I've started doing that. It's the same, same thing, Stokey Tennis. But um, I'm honored to be your first, man. You'll, you'll never forget this first coach's mailbag. And I'm happy to come back on whenever you want. Love it. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks so much. All right, man.